Could you get my confirmation email? Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Most wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Most wonderful, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Most wonderful good morning. Good morning. Most wonderful good morning.
Good morning. Good morning, Tom. Uh, um, I've got a question. You know the email that I sent you? Yeah. Um, are we allowed to self citate? So, even though it's copying, well, not copying, but using the same material, if I reference my own stuff? Because it says I need permission from the lecturer to do that. Ask the lecturer? I thought it was you. For what? Is it not? You're not the one that's doing the lab report and the rest of it. For what? Um, For what? BI302. Morning. Morning. I have nothing to do with BI302. Okay. Right. Terribly sorry. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I already emailed him, but I think I might have sent it to the wrong email address. It's uh, got like three different ones. Yeah, so good morning. Good morning. Um, as I said, BI302 has nothing to do with me. I've got enough problems to <laughs> BI301 and 308. Thank you very much. No worries. Morning. <coughs> so tonight, Wednesday? Yeah. You have fire alarms going off at the library. Huh? You have fire alarms going off at the library. What did you do? I, it wasn't me. It wasn't once. you? Oh. No, it wasn't. No, <laughs> I'm pleased to hear that. I had a fire marshal who told me that I couldn't go this way. And I was like, I have a lecture. And he's like, you're going to die. And I'm like, hmm. Well, uh, well uh, in a way, it's almost a sort of a philosophical point, isn't it? I'm we like, are all, all going to die. die. <laughs> yeah? Because life is fatal. It's like, you can't walk that way. You need to go to the fire assembly point. I'm like, but I wasn't even in the library. <laughs> It's a little bit like uh, uh, on the London Underground where it says dogs must be carried. So where do you get a dog from when you go on the, on the, on the escalator? Yeah, very true. You can make a lot of money. <laughs> Selling dogs. No, renting a dog. Renting a dog. Yeah? And you just train the dog to run up or down again to you. And I love that. That would be amazing. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, most wonderful good morning to all of you. As per usual, please don't forget to sign in, register your attendance wherever in the world you are. Just let us know that you are present. Can I also please remind people that quiz number two for BI 301 closes on Sunday at 5 p.m. And usually I'm pretty good at closing the quiz then. So you haven't done it uh, already, please, please, please do, because these are really easy marks, especially since you can do the quiz as often as you like. And if for one reason or another you want to repeat experiment one for your mini project, you have the opportunity to do so next week on Thursday, uh, on Tuesday from 10 to 1. There is no lab session on Monday afternoon or on Tuesday afternoon because you don't need these lab sessions. Hopefully, everything went swimming, and you got really nice plots. 
And if you're not sure whether you should repeat or not, send me an email, say, I've got this, for example, line with a Berg plot. It looks like, you know, a dog's dinner. Do you, should I repeat? And I can make a decision, I can help you. Yes, repeat or, no, it's actually not too bad. So uh, you don't have to come in, yeah? In order to make this decision, however, you have to have your data analyzed. And you have to email me by Monday, only so that we can have enough uh, workstations ready on Tuesday morning. Please don't come in Monday afternoon or Tuesday afternoon. There won't be anyone, and you won't get into the labs. OK? Happy with that? Fantastic. Right, now, so far in this module, what we have done is we have looked at enzymes, we have done the Michaelis Menten equation, we have described enzymes, we have uh, developed uh, parameters for enzymes, um, we have looked at inhibitors and how they uh, affect enzymes, we even have looked at enzymes that work with two substrates last week. And we have sort of pretended that enzymes are in isolation. But of course, that's not the case. Enzymes are an integral part of metabolic biochemical pathways. Something like that. That is an overview of about 50% of the reactions that at every moment happen in your cell. And of course, it depends on the cell. So for example, if a cell, like a red blood cell, doesn't have mitochondria, then quite a significant part of this map doesn't happen because there is no Krebs cycle in uh, red blood cells. They rely entirely on glycolysis for their energy production. And what you can see here is a sort of a general map. And if you look closer, for example, what you would find here is, let's say, here is a very prominent pathway. This is glycolysis. We will discuss that in uh, one of the subsequent lectures. We have here a central part. That is the Krebs cycle, or TCA, or uh, citric acid cycle. And again, we will discuss that. We've got a weird thing that looks like a spiral down here. That's beta oxidation of fatty acids. And we will discuss these things. And every single step of these, you know, God knows how many thousand reactions is catalyzed by an enzyme. Um, and the fantastic thing, if you think about it, the fantastic thing is Although an enzyme catalyzes only one reaction, works on one or a few very similar substrates, you have them all packed together. And when all these enzymes come together in the cell, they do something absolutely what I would, you know, would call mind-blowing. The combination of all these enzymes, of all these reactions, and every single reaction is just a little bit, tiny little part, but put them together and they change everything. In a way, the whole is far more than just the sum of the individual parts. The whole cell, in a way, 
is completely different to just adding up these little enzyme reactions that we have. It's a little bit like if you look at the brain. Every single neuron in your skull, you've got about 80, million, 80 billion neurons in your brain. Every single neuron can only do two things. It can either fire or not fire. It has only two states. But put them all together, and it totally changes things. You gain consciousness, well, most of the time. You develop emotions. You hate thermodynamics, for example. Yeah? All these things. Just by putting neurons together. This is what is called emergent behavior. That you have small compounds that only can do something, a little bit, but put them together and you get a total fascinating plethora of responses. Totally different. And actually, that's called life. Only if you put these things together, you get this emergent behavior that is life in all its varieties. And I think that is incredibly fascinating. But actually, if you think about it, what drives life? What makes a metabolic pathway, like glycolysis or the uh, Krebs cycle, what makes them go? Why do they happen? Actually, the answer is, whether you like it or not, is thermodynamics. Because we know that in order to have life, it has to go in a certain direction. It has to flow in a certain direction. And this flow, again, is directed by the laws of thermodynamics. Without thermodynamics, no life. It's very simple. And you can actually say the thermodynamics of life, and you have discussed thermodynamics, you can write that as delta G, that is Gibbs free energy or uh, free energy or Gibbs energy, there are different versions. Uh, I use them probably interchangeable, but uh, which is probably wrong, but I don't care. Delta G of life is negative. It means we always go with our, with our energy from a higher level to a lower level. If we turn it around, if we go from low level to high level, there's no life. Even if delta G would be, the energy would be zero, no life. Life would not exist. So delta G for life is negative. And of course, you know, delta G negative means a reaction happens. So life happens if delta G is negative. And this delta G tells us whether a reaction is feasible or whether it is not feasible. So let's just simply take a simple reaction. Let's say A plus, oh, let me write this slightly different. A plus B, we have a reversible reaction, gives C plus D. And if our Gibbs energy is negative, delta G smaller than zero, which means negative, then the reaction 
moves in this direction. It goes from left to right. That is what delta G says. If delta G is positive, then we look at the reaction in a different way, in the opposite direction. It goes from right to the left. And it goes until the reaction comes to a standstill. So if we've got delta G equals 0, then there's no movement. Then we have reached, in this case, the equilibrium. There is no movement. Everything is sorted. Everything comes to a standstill. That's great in theory. And yet, when we talk about metabolic pathways, when we talk about the integration of enzymes into a far more complex things, we need to be careful. Because an equilibrium means we have a closed system. There's no energy going in, no particles going in, no energy coming out, no particles coming out. It's closed. End of. That is when eventually we will get an equilibrium. But life isn't like that. We all consume energy to be alive. So energy comes from somewhere. Ultimately, of course, it comes from the sun, produces, is, is, is used for photosynthesis in plants, primary, secondary, tertiary uh, consumers. You all know about the food chains and things like that. So what we are dealing with is not an equilibrium, because equilibrium is dead. What we are actually dealing with is the next best thing of an equilibrium. It is what is called a steady state. So let's say we have something like that here. A is produced. Then A produces B, and B is consumed, something like that. As you can see, it's not an equilibrium. There is no equilibrium. Equilibrium would be, would be that, something like this. In the best case, what we get is that there is no change in, for example, A and B. That our production of A is exactly offset by the consumption of A. And we can say, well, this is almost sort of an equilibrium, but technically it's not an equilibrium, because here our system is not closed. It is open. But the good thing is, we can almost see this as something like an equilibrium, but we need to be aware it's not an equilibrium, technically. So what this is called, when there's no change, let's say, in the concentration of A or B, this is the famous, famous offline. Let's see if we get them back. 
I apologize. Steady state. Yeah. So we are dealing, when we talk about biology, we are usually not talking about equilibria. We are talking about steady state. And that's quite important. Now let's go back to this delta G. Our Gibbs energy. And we said this is th this delta G is the thing that tells us whether a reaction happens in a certain direction or not. Now, what does this reaction, what does this delta G depend on? Delta G is made up of two different compounds. The first compound or component, delta G, is what happens under absolute standard conditions. That's box standard. And that is usually abbreviated as delta G naught. That's what you can look up in textbooks. This is under absolutely clearly defined conditions, delta G naught. And it's usually all your compounds are at a concentration of one molar. pH, I think it is 0. Or maybe it's 1, I can't remember. Uh, pressure, all defined. Now, of course, the bio, bio, and that is sort of um, what the physicists came up with. That's our standard free energy. Of course, the biologists said, <laughs> wait a moment. We never have pH of 0. So that's nonsense. Yeah? And if the physicist says, OK, then we calculate everything instead of pH of seven, uh, in, instead of pH of zero, because we like you biologists, we, we calculate everything for pH seven. And to indicate that this is now sort of physiological calculation, this standard free energy has got this little prime to indicate that everything is at pH 7. The message is still the same. If we look at our reaction here, A plus B uh, gives C plus D. If delta G naught prime is smaller than 0, then it means the reaction goes in that direction under standard conditions. If delta G naught prime is larger than 0, then the reaction goes in that direction. under standard conditions. Yeah? Happy with that? But then, you see, that is standard conditions. And we are still at con concentrations of everything with one molar. So here's standard free energy, everything at one molar. Now, of course, that does not reflect the situation in the cell, does it? We hardly ever have any compounds that has a concentration higher than, let's say, millimolar, 10 millimolar, maybe 100 millimolar, but that is really the top end. So all concentrations in a cell are much smaller than one molar. Why, actually? 
Why are all compounds, the concentration, are so much smaller? Why are they really small, these concentrations? Could you, could you envisage a reason for that? Why are concentrations of metabolites usually very small? Think about it. You have a pot with lots and lots of salt. And let's say you put a cell into it. What happens to this poor cell in lots and lots of salt? What happens? Sorry? The water would leave the, the cell. Exactly. The cell would shrivel up. That is because the high concentration of the salt would bind all the water. So here the key word is osmolarity. That is why the components, the metabolites in the cell, need to be at a low concentration so that they don't, in a way, suck up all the water. Because we know that the water is absolutely essential for all the reactions in the cell. And if you don't have any free water available because your concentration of the metabolites are too, too high, then you are truly and royally um, compromised. Yeah, that's why metabolites are at low concentrations. And therefore, actually, we need to have a second term here that actually makes it not standard, that makes it, in a way, special or truly physiological. And I like to think of that as what I call delta G Q, delta G, no, do I get it right? Maybe. Delta G Q. Have you heard about delta G Q? Probably not, because I just made it up. This is actually, this delta G Q is under true physiological conditions. With the actual concentrations, actual concentrations of the metabolites that we are looking at. OK, now let's dig a little bit deeper. You know that delta G naught prime can also be written in a slightly different form. And I think you have done that with Dr. Uh, Williamson. <coughs> Delta G naught prime can be also written as minus RT natural logarithm of the equilibrium constant. Have you seen that? Yeah, you've done that. R, of course, is the gas constant, 8.3 joule per Kelvin and mole. T is the temperature in Kelvin, and the K equilibrium, that's the equilibrium constant for this reaction. So that would be concentration of C times D over A times B. <coughs> that's the equilibrium constant when the whole thing has reached its equilibrium. 
Yeah? So that's our delta G. What is delta G Q? Well, that's a very similar thing. Delta G Q is negative R T, so you don't need to learn anything new, LN, you still don't need to learn anything new, Q. And we've got a negative sign here as well. So what on earth is Q, please? Q is actually very similar to the equilibrium constant. It is concentration of C times concentration of D divided by the concentration of A times concentration of B. But this time, it is with the actual concentrations of the compounds. Oops, that's not good. Doesn't like me today, huh? This is now with the actual concentration. <coughs> Not with one molar, but actually the concentration that we find in the cell. So let's do a little example. Let's say we have A plus B gives us C plus D. We have, what did I do? We say the concentrations in the cell that we can measure Concentration of C, just for convenience, same as D, equals one micromolar, or one times 10 to the minus 6 molar. Concentration of A equals concentration of B. Let's put that to one millimolar, or one times 10 to the minus three molar. These are the actual concentrations in the cell. Now we know from textbooks, from tables, that our delta G prime, delta G naught prime, our standard free energy equals positive 10 kilojoule per mole. Quick question, what do we expect this reaction to do? Does it go from left to right, or does it go from right to left? Goes from loud? Say? It was right. Who said it? Goes from? It goes from right to the left. So it goes that way. This reaction would go that way. 
right? So the reaction A plus B to C plus D would not be feasible. It goes in the wrong direction. Now, let's see what happens if we put in our actual concentrations. We have delta G equals delta G naught prime minus delta G Q. So that here is plus 10 kilojoule per mole minus minus RT ln Q and instead of Q I can write and this is called the mass action ratio I can write 1 times 10 to the minus 6 molar times 1 times 10 to the minus 6 molar divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar times 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. My molar cancel out. I have 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the minus 6 gives me Ten to the minus twelve divided by ten to the minus six, and that gives me ten to the minus six. So I have ten kilojoule per mole. Let's say we do this reaction at thirty-seven degrees minus minus eight point three times. 37 degrees in Kelvin. What's that? What's that? How do I convert Kelvin into a centigrade? Zero degrees is 273 Kelvin. So we have 273 plus 37 ln natural logarithm 10 to the minus 6. So we have 10 kilojoules per mole. Minus times minus is plus. 8.3 times 310 times ln 10 to the minus 6. This gives us roughly 35.6 negative kilojoule per mole. So we have 10 kilojoule positive minus 35 kilojoule per mole, and therefore our overall delta G is negative 25.6 kilojoule per mole.
Which direction does this reaction now go? Does it go left to right or right to left? Where does it go? Does it go from A, a plus B? Come here. It goes from left to the right because delta G is negative. Very strongly negative, actually. Under standard conditions, remember, we said under standard conditions, the reaction goes from right to the left. But who gives a, uh, who cares about standard conditions? Because we are actually looking at what's happening in the cell. And the cell doesn't have standard conditions. So standard conditions say it goes from right to left. But when we take account of what is actually happening in the cell, the reaction goes from left to right. Do you get that? Yeah? Now, how do we make a reaction like this A plus B goes, is uh, reversible, it's converted to C plus D. How do we make this reaction actually happening? And you've just seen it. What we do is, in order to make this reaction go from left to the right, what we do is, we keep the concentrations of C and D very, very small compared to A and B. So we keep C and D small, and then our reaction will go from left to the right. You all know about that because that is what has been taught to you as the principle of Le Chatelier and Brown, that a reaction tries to escape any force. The force here would be a high concentration of A and B. So a high concentration of A and B would shift the, con the, the reaction towards C and D. <laughs> How does that work in the cell? Well, very easily. To do is we need to remove C and D. We just let C and D react and form, let's say, E plus F. So if this happens, the concentration of C and D is low, it's very low, and it pulls the whole thing towards E and F. Of course, we want then to keep E and F low to make this happen. So what do we need to do? Ah, actually, we remove E and F to, let's say, G. Now, what do we need to do in order to keep this reaction going from E and F to G? Well, we, re we need to remove G. H and J. This is the principle of life. Hey, guys, this is thermodynamics driving a metabolic pathway. Just by keeping the products small moves a reaction in the right direction in which we want it. Here's another fantastic example and this will be in the exam, I can tell you that. We have ATP, and this is hydrolyzed to ADP plus inorganic phosphate. ATP, the currency of the cell, the energy currency of the cell. We know that delta G 
naught prime for this reaction, would you say this reaction is thermodynamically feasible or not? Would you say the reaction goes from left to right or right to left under standard conditions? What would you say? Yeah, you you do the right thing with the eyes. Say, you're right. Goes from yes, it goes from left to the right. This reaction, what ha that happens. Every, every second in your body, the hydrolysis of ATP, which generates energy for other things, for example, a muscle converts the chemical energy into mechanical energy or kinetic energy into movement. This reaction goes from left to the right. So delta G naught prime the standard free energy must be smaller than zero, must be negative. And in fact, it is around negative 36 to negative 38 kilojoule per mole. That is the standard. But we know that the standard is pretty much doesn't totally matter because it really depends then on the concentration of the different compounds. And in, for example, a resting human muscle, We have the following concentration. We have ATP at 8 millimolar. ADP is 9 micromolar. And free phosphate is around 4 millimolar. So what we can do now is we can calculate delta G equals delta G standard minus RT ln, well, let's write that down immediately, 9 times 10 to the minus 3 times 4, oh, 10 to the minus 6, 4 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 8 times 10 to the minus 3. And if everything is in molar, we don't need to specify that. So everything has to be molar. In mole per liter or capital M. So we get delta G naught prime minus RT ln. What do we get? Uh, that is, that cancels out, that cancels out 4 divided by 8. That's half. Uh, so we get 4.5 times 10 to the minus 6. R is 8.3. And T is 310. We do that at 37 degrees because we've got a human muscle. And we get, I think I've written it down somewhere. Oh, yeah. For this, we get. Negative 36 kilojoule per mole. Have I done? Have I? 
that correct? I think so. So our delta G start, let's say we have this as Well, somebody will probably correct me when they do the calculations, but just to, to give you a rough idea. So we have negative 36 kilojoule per mole from our delta G naught prime, and we've got another minus 36 kilojoule per mole Sorry. So if we take them together, the ATP delta G hydrolysis for ATP is between fi negative 50 and negative 70 kilojoule per mole in the cell. Just simply because we keep the concentrations of ADP in this case very small. Concentration is small, so we get an additional boost from our delta G Q. And actually, this is sort of almost like an additional battery in it. Under standard conditions, it would be minus 36. But by keeping the ADP concentration very small, we not only get minus 36, we get minus 70, which gives us additional energy to do things. Does that make sense? We can actually rewrite this delta G we said it is minus RT ln K equilibrium minus minus RT ln Q. And we can fiddle a little bit. Equals minus RT ln K plus RT LNQ We can write this as RT of LNQ minus LNK And under the rules of logarithm Combine that as RT LN Q over K. So that's delta G. Actually, what this expression here, Q over the equilibrium, tells us is how far away is, are the actual concentrations, how far away are they actually from, an, from the equilibrium concentrations? Let me write that down because it's so cool.
far are the actual concentrations away from the equilibrium concentrations? Well, in other words, how much does this reaction want to go towards the equilibrium? What drives it? And if our Q If Q over K is smaller than 1, then our ln Q over K will become negative. Delta G will become negative. And the reaction happens. If Q over K is larger than 1, it's larger than 1, then delta G becomes positive. The reaction doesn't happen. And if Q over K equals 1, then we've reached equilibrium. Bang! Nothing happens then. Everything comes to a standstill. That is where the reaction stops. Whoa, we've covered a lot of ground. There are some practice questions on my wonderful website. Please don't forget to do your quiz. Have a look at your practical stuff. Let me know if you want to repeat the practical. Go in peace. And I don't see you tomorrow. Tomorrow my colleague, uh, Dr. Liz Curling, uh, will give you some career stuff in BI38. Have a great weekend. I know it's Wednesday. See you next week. Take care. <laughs>